Good Monday morning. Welcome to Begin in the Word. Today we look at Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 20, where the Bible says, What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin as it is written. None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law, comes knowledge of sin. This text is sometimes called the catena of Romans chapter 3. That comes from the Latin word catena, which means chain, and it is so named because here the apostle chains together six different quotations from the Old Testament to assert his claim that all are under sin. Now, remember back when we studied Romans chapter 3 last week, we talked about how Paul asked the question, is there any advantage to the Jew? Do they have, is there any value in circumcision? And he says, much in every way. There is a value in the fact that they were entrusted the oracles of God. But when it comes down to it, are we any Jews any better off, he says? And the answer is not at all, because we are under sin. Now, we have said already in our study of Romans that Romans chapter 1 is about demonstrating that the Greeks are under sin, or the Gentiles, and Romans chapter 2 is about demonstrating that the Jews are under sin. And Paul summarizes that here. He says, we have already charged, we've already made the claim that both Jews and Greeks are under sin. So here he is summarizing what he has done in Romans chapter 1 and Romans chapter 2. But also, think about this word charged, because it has been pointed out by many commentators that Romans chapter 3 carries with it a courtroom scene. And here we have the accusation, the charge. The charge is that all are under sin. And the apostle will then muster evidence to support that charge from the Old Testament. And that's what verses 10 through 18 do. Now let's think about these particular Old Testament quotations. The first quotation comes from Psalm 14, 1 through 3. It's also repeated in a later psalm. This is Psalm 14, 1 through 3. And this is a psalm of David, which is about the oppression of the wicked and his longing for a redeemer to come from Zion. Now, we don't know when David wrote this psalm, but we might assume that because he talks about the Redeemer coming from Zion, that this occurs perhaps after he took Jerusalem and made it the capital of his kingdom, the seventh year into his reign. So David here is longing for the time that there would come a Redeemer from Zion to defeat the wicked. And in the course of that, he talks about how there are none who are righteous. No one is understands, not even one, not even one, he says. Now, we might ask ourselves the question, who did David think would come from Zion to redeem his people? Was he not, after all, the king reigning from Jerusalem? Was that not his job to defeat the wicked and to bring justice and peace? But even still, David looks forward to this time when there would come a redeemer from Zion. So that's this first quote, this Psalm 14 quote from David, where he he looks forward to this redeemer from Zion and he bemoans the condition of the wicked. The second comes from Psalm 5.9. Psalm 5.9 is a psalm of David in which he describes God's displeasure with human wickedness, and he longs for God to cause his enemies to bear their own guilt, and that's here where he says, their throat is an open grave, they use their tongues to deceive, that is from verse 13a. The third quote is, the venom of asps is under their lips, that's 13b, that comes from Psalm 140, verse 3. Again, a psalm of David in which he asked God to deliver him from his enemies. The venom of asps is under their lips. The next one is from Psalm 10 and 7. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Now, this is an interesting one. We have to say something about this because in the Septuagint, that is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, Psalm 9 and 10 are combined under one psalm. So Psalm 9 and 10 are one psalm in the Septuagint. And it is a psalm that is under the heading, 
for the end concerning the secrets of the son, a psalm of David. So very high likelihood that the Apostle Paul sees this as a messianic psalm, no doubt given the heading concerning the secrets of the son, that might lead him to think that. This psalm too is about the plight of the oppressed at the hand of the wicked. And for the author's desire, it was David in this case, to see God execute judgment on the wicked. And it includes a promise that God would rule forever and ever. And also in verse 21 in the Septuagint, he says, Appoint, O Lord, a lawgiver over them. Let the nations know that they are mere humans. So again, here we have a Psalm of David here in Psalm 10 and 7 being quoted here by the Apostle Paul, in which David is yearning for God's rule, God's reign over the wicked enemies. The next quotation, the fifth one, is from Isaiah, Isaiah 59, 7 and 8. Their feet are swift to shed blood and their paths are ruined in misery in the way of peace they have not known. This is a passage we often hear referenced in sermons, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, where we are told that our sins, our iniquities have separated us from God. And that's the context here. God's own people, Jacob. They have sinned, and their sinful condition has separated them, them from God. Their state of rebellion has caused him to withhold his hand from them. It's not that he couldn't do it. It's not that he couldn't reach them and save them. It's that their sin has caused this separation. And in that context, he says their feet are swift to shed blood and so forth. This passage concludes with a promise that a Redeemer will come to Zion to those in Jacob who turn from transgression. So again, a messianic passage. And the final quotation is again, a Psalm of David, Psalm 36 and one, in which he speaks of the nature of the wicked in contrast to the steadfast love and righteousness of God. And he then asked God to grant him victory over against the wicked. So here we have six quotations. Five of the six are from David. Five of the six are about God's anointed and the wicked who have risen up against him in a call for God to bring justice. Two of the six call to mind God's promise to have a deliverer from Zion. And again, again, another one, if we include Psalm 10 and 7, refers to a coming lawgiver in the reign of God over his enemies. So you can see there are themes that tie these verses together. And that raises an interesting question for us. Why did Paul choose these six passages out of all the passages in the Old Testament? Why did he choose these six to make his case, to make his charge as his evidence, as exhibit A in the case that both Jews and Greeks are under sin? Well, here we see the brilliance of the Apostle Paul. This is not an accidental list of quotations. There are many themes that tie these together. The first and most obvious one is that Paul here alludes to the various body parts of mankind and their propensity to sin. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. Under their lips, mouth is full of curses. Feet are swift to shed blood. And there's no fear of God before their eyes. Paul pulls together these various body parts and shows how in each of them, humanity's wickedness and sin is revealed. Now, how many of us could, at a moment's notice, from the Rolodex of our mind, pull together quotations from the Old Testament to show that from every body part, humanity is sinful and wicked? I don't think many of us have the ability to do that. The Apostle Paul can. The Apostle Paul has spent his life in study of God's word, and so he is able to pull these together to have a poetic argument that every part of humanity is thoroughly corrupt. But on top of that, it's not without mistake that five of the six quotations are from David, specifically about God's anointed and those who are wicked rising up against him. And so you can see how Paul pulls these quotations together to show not only is the whole of humanity wicked, their eyes, their mouth, their tongue, their feet, but this wickedness is a wickedness of humanity against God's anointed. And this passage in Isaiah clearly demonstrates that this is not just about Gentiles, but this is about Jews who have rejected their own king and the condition they find themselves in is their own doing. And God has to promise a redeemer to come and save them from Zion. And so all of these passages fit together very neatly, very clearly, to make it abundantly clear that Jews and Greeks are under sin. All of humanity is under sin. In fact, that's what he concludes with. He says, we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, that is, Jews. So that every mouth, and by every mouth he means both Jew and Gentile, every mouth may be stopped. The whole world, that is every nation, including those of Jacob, may be held accountable to God. Every Jew, 
every Greek. Now remember, back in Romans chapter 1, his opening thesis in verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation, both to the Jew and to the Greek. And so Paul wants to demonstrate that God's salvation is universal because the plight of humanity under sin is universal. And then he says this, by, by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Now here, when he says the law, he's referring to this quotation from six different passages. It's an interesting thing he says that, because these don't come from the first five books of Moses proper. Paul is fine with referring to the entire corpus of the Old Testament as the law. You'll see him do something similar in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And here he says, by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. We would be remiss if we left this passage without talking about what is meant by the phrase, the works of the law. This is a hotly debated phrase if you've followed the various controversies around interpretation of Paul's over the last 40 years. There are some who would say, well, works of the law refer to any good deed, anything we do. And there will be some who say, no, works of the law refers to things like circumcision, Sabbath keeping, the dietary laws, things that were the ethnic badge markers that demarcated Jews as being different and separate from Gentiles. Now, this is a phrase that Paul doesn't just use in Romans. In fact, he introduces this earlier in a letter to the Galatians. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 through 11, he actually brings this up in Galatians chapter 2, but we'll bring this up, this verse into consideration so that we can see what he means when he refers to the works of the law. He says, for all who re rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. Now, there's a few things we can see from this text that help us understand what is meant by the phrase works of the law. The first thing is I don't believe Paul is selecting a subsection of the commands of the law, such as circumcision, Sabbath keeping. Certainly those things are part of it, but that's not inclusive of all that Paul means. And we know that because when he quotes from the Old Testament to elaborate on what he means by works of the law, he quotes this, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. And he summarizes it saying no one is justified before God by the law. And so works of the law, the phrase the law, and then all things written in them are all synonymous. And so it's clear to me that what Paul is saying when he says we are not saved by works of the law, he means the entirety of Torah law. The law of Moses and our adherence to that cannot save us. That's not what the law was for. That's not what the law was intended to do. And he's going to explain that in Romans. The law and adherence to that law could not save us. That is already demonstrated to us that no one can be perfectly obedient to the law. That's what Romans 2 demonstrated. And so the law cannot save us, but on the contrary, the righteous shall live by faith. So works of the law stands in opposition to living by faith. You see that? And so we should see works of the law as referring to Torah and its obedience, and we should see living by faith as what we do under the Christian covenant. So he says, we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. He says, we know by works of the law, that is by obedience to Moses, no human being will be justified in his sight. The law couldn't save. In fact, the purpose of the law was to demonstrate sin, to create a knowledge of sin. So where does that leave us? Where does that leave us in the scheme of God's redemption? Because God called Abraham and created a nation through Abraham, and he gave them the law. And those descendants existed down to Paul's day in the nation of the Jews. And here he has claimed that the Jews are not better off. And so if God's nation, God's people, the descendants of Abraham, are not better off than the Gentiles— who are going to face destruction because of their sin, where does that leave the scheme of redemption? Does that not mean that God's righteousness, his promises to redeem the world, going back all the way to Genesis 3.15, does that not mean that the scheme of redemption has failed? 
no one is righteous, not even one. There isn't a soul alive who can be saved by the works of the law. Thank you for joining us today on Begin in the Word. It's my hope that just as you have begun today in the Word of God, you will live out today in the Word of God.